between two point size charges Q1 and Q2, there is an electric force vector F equals KQ1 Q2 over R squared, which points in the direction R hat. This unit vector lies along the line joining the two charges. R hat is the vector R divided by the magnitude of R, so that's R cosine theta I hat plus R sine theta J hat divided by the magnitude R. We cancel the three R's and have R hat equals cosine theta I hat plus sine theta J hat. Force is measured in newtons. The two charges contain an electrical energy U equals K Q1 Q2 over R, which is measured in joules. If the size of charge Q1 is differential, dQ, then the force and energy are also differential. We have the differential force vector, dF equals R hat KQ2 over R squared, dQ, and the differential energy, dU equals KQ2 over R, dQ. Integration is used to find the total force between point charge Q2 and an extended object, such as a one-dimensional bar. The total force and energy are found by adding up all the little forces, dF, and energies, du, that vary in magnitude. We have the total vector force F is the sum of the little pieces of force, dF, but we decided that the differential force vector dF equals kq2 over r squared r hat dq. The total energy U is obtained by adding all the little pieces of energy du that vary in magnitude, but we decided that the differential energy du equals kq2 over r dq. For example, let's determine the total force on charge q2 due to a bar of length L and charge big Q. Charge Q is distance A from the nearest end of the bar that lies along the x-axis. The linear charge density of the bar is lambda equals big Q over L, which is constant in this example. If the linear charge density lambda equals 3 coulombs per meter and the bar has a length of 4 meters, then the total charge in the bar would be 12 coulombs. The differential charge dQ in a segment of length dx would be dQ equals lambda dx. Each charge element dQ comprising the extended bar exerts a force dF equals kQ2 dQ over x squared on charge Q2 that is a distance x away, where x varies from A to A plus L. The total force is found by adding up all the little forces, dF, from each of the charge elements, dQ. This force is one-dimensional, and we have the total force, F, equals the sum of all the little pieces of force, dF, equals kQ2 over x squared, lambda dx. When you integrate 1 over x squared, you get minus 1 over x that we evaluate at both limits. To simplify this, we put both fractions over a common denominator, cancel A in the numerator, and get the resulting force F equals KQ2 big Q over A times A plus L. The potential energy of charge Q2 due to all of the little dQs along the length of the bar is found by the scalar integration U equals integral of du, which is an integral of KQ2 over x times lambda dx. When you integrate 1 over x, you get an ln of x, evaluated at the two limits. We can write the result as kq2 big Q over L times the natural log of 1 plus L over A. If a second identical bar is placed a distance A away along the positive y-axis, then the net force on q2 would be found from the vector addition of the two forces producing a total vector force F equals I hat plus J hat times KQ2 big Q over A times A plus L. The potential energy of the two bars, which is obtained with scalar addition, is twice that of either bar, so U equals 2 KQ2 big Q over L, ln of 1 plus L over A. 
A bar of charge big Q lies along the x-axis with its left edge at x equal minus a and its right edge at x equal minus a plus l. Point B is located at x equals zero, y equals minus B. The constant linear charge density of the bar is lambda equals big Q over L. A segment of differential length dx contains charge dq equals lambda dx and produces a differential force vector df equals kq2 over r squared dq and it points in the r hat direction which lies along the line joining dq and q2. The little piece of charge dq is located at x. In this triangle we have r equals the square root of x squared plus b squared. Cosine theta equals b over r and sine theta equals x over r. Here are the differential components of vector df. The x component will be df sub x equals sine theta df. df sub y equals cosine theta df. The charge dq might be positive or it might be negative. What is the force on charge q2 placed at point p? The differential vector force df between q2 and dq lies along r and has components in both the x and y directions. We find the total horizontal force by adding all the little df sub x equals sine theta df pieces that vary in magnitude. The x component of the total force comes from adding up the little df sub x's which are sine theta df but df is kq2 over r squared dq dq equals lambda dx and sine theta is x over r. The r cubed in the denominator makes x squared plus b squared to the three halves power. Here we have x squared in the bottom and x in the top. This is a u du integration when lambda is constant and we get this result. where we use this antiderivative. The y component of the total force is found by adding up all the little dfs of y equal cosine theta df pieces that vary in magnitude. We have the y component of the total force f sub y equals the sum of the little forces df sub y which are cosine theta df but df is kq2 over r squared dq. Cosine theta is b over r and dq equals lambda dx. When lambda is a constant we use this antiderivative and obtain this result. The net vector force f equals f sub x i hat plus f sub y j hat and points in the direction given by tan inverse f sub y over f sub x. If lambda is a complicated function of x, then we use numerical integration. For b much greater than l and b much greater than a, we get f sub x equals kq2 big Q over bl and f sub y equals kq2 big Q over b squared while a force between two point charges falls with distance as 1 over r squared, we see that f sub x goes down with separation distance as 1 over b. This occurs because the charge bar consists of many point charges. What is the potential energy of charge q2? The total energy u is found by adding up all the little pieces of energy du that vary in magnitude. But earlier we decided that du equals kq2 over r dq, where r equals the square root of x squared plus b squared, and dq equals lambda dx. Using this antiderivative, we get this result. 
The work done to move charge Q2 from infinity to point P is equal to this stored potential energy. A charged arc has constant radius big R, is centered at the origin, has linear charge density lambda, that is a function of theta, and extends from theta I to theta F. For example, we might have theta I equals minus pi over 3, and theta F equals plus pi over 5. What is the electric force and potential energy of charge Q2 that is at the origin? The arc S equal theta R has differential dS equals big R d theta, and contains charge dQ equals lambda dS equals lambda big R d theta. The total charge in the arc is big Q equals the integral of dQ equals the integral of lambda big R d theta. If dQ is positive and Q2 is positive, then the differential force dF points in this direction. As the little charge dQ is sometimes positive and sometimes negative, this force vector dF will sometimes point toward dq and sometimes away from dq. The integration sums the result. The differential force vector df has y component, df sub y equals df cosine theta, but df is k over big R squared, and dq is lambda r d theta. The x component of the differential force is df sub x equals df sine theta, but df is kq2 over r squared dq, and dq is lambda big R d theta. The total electric force is found by adding up all the little tiny forces df that vary in magnitude as theta goes from theta i to theta f. The x component of this is f sub x equals the integral of df sub x equals the integral of sine theta df equals k over r times the integral of lambda of theta sine theta d theta. And the total energy is u equals integral of du equals kq2 times the integral of lambda d theta. And this gives kq2 big Q over r which is the same energy as would occur if the arc were a point charge. Charge Q2 lies at a point along the x-axis. Find the electric force on Q2 due to a ring of radius B and charge big Q. The ring is positively charged and Q2 is negatively charged. The ring lies in the yz plane and its central axis lies along the x-axis. We look at two symmetrically located charge elements as shown. The y components of these two forces will cancel. The net force lies along the minus x direction with cosine theta equals x over r. The x component of the total force comes from adding all the little dfs of x's that vary in magnitude, but dfs of x equals cosine theta df cosine theta equals x over r and df equals kq2 over r squared dq. But then a miracle happens as the integration works its way around the ring. x, r, and theta are constants that are removed from the integrand. When we integrate dq, we get big Q. So the result is kq2 big Q x over r cubed. With r equals the square root of b squared plus x squared, we get the x component of the net force equals minus k times the absolute value of q2 big Q times x over b squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power. We use the absolute value of the q's because we've already taken into account their arithmetic signs in deciding the direction of the force. If charge q2 is located off axis, then r and theta are not constant. The law of cosines must be used, and the solution is written in terms of an elliptic integral, as discussed later on. Oscillations will occur when charge Q2 is placed a small distance along either the positive or the negative x-axis and released. Small oscillations occur when x is much less than b, so that 
b squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power equals b squared to the 3 halves power, which is b cubed. And Newton's second law is the x component of force equals minus k big Q q2x over b cubed equals m d squared x dt squared or dx squared dt squared plus omega squared x equals zero where omega squared equals k big Q q2 over m b cubed. The solution to this differential equation is x of t equals a cosine omega t. When q2 is along the central axis, we obtain this result for the force between that charge and a ring of charge big Q. When you sum up the force from lots of little rings whose radii vary from zero to big R, then you obtain the force between the point charge Q2 and a disk of charge big Q. In the previous result, the x component of the force was minus k q2 big qx over b squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power. We let q go to dq and f sub x go to df sub x and then integrate. This differential ring has radius b, circumference 2 pi b, and differential area dA equals 2 pi b times the thickness db. This differential ring contains a charge dq equals sigma dA equals 2 pi b sigma db, where sigma is the number of coulombs per square meter. For example, if sigma equals 3 coulombs per square meter, then the charge in an area A equals 2 meters squared would contain q equals sigma A equals 6 coulombs. The total force on charge q2 due to all of the differential rings is found by integrating from b equals zero to r, two pi b sigma k q two x over b squared plus x squared to the three halves power db. b is the integration variable. We have a function of b squared in the bottom and a b in the top, so this is a u du integration with this result, where we have used sigma equals big q over pi r squared as the constant charge density of this material. Likewise, a cylinder of length L and radius big R can be treated as a series of disks of area A equals pi R squared, thickness dx, and charge dq equals rho dv equals rho pi R squared dx, where rho is the volume charge density in coulombs per cubic meter. In the previous result, we let q go to dq and force go to df and then integrate. Then the x component of the total force is found by integrating from a to a plus l 2k q2 rho times pi times 1 over x minus 1 over the square root of r squared plus x squared dx. And we get this result. This can instead be done as a triple integral using dq equals rho dv equals r dr dp dz in cylindrical coordinates. To calculate the electric force between two cylinders will require six integrations. Using a triple integral to find the electric field of a cylinder that has a constant charge density rho. This differential charge dq creates an electric field dE along the central x-axis at x equals a. The x component of the electric field E sub x is found by adding up the little pieces of electric field dE sub x that vary in magnitude. But dE sub x equals cosine theta dE, where dE is k dq over r squared with r squared equal x squared plus b squared and cosine theta equals x over r. In cylindrical coordinates we have dq equals charge density rho times differential volume dv equals b db dx d phi. When the charge density rho equals total charge q divided by total volume v which would be pi r squared times l 
the integral becomes e sub x equals constant rho times constant k. We integrate x from a to a plus l. We integrate b from 0 to big R. We integrate phi from 0 to 2 pi. We have b times x over x squared plus b squared to the 3 halves power. d phi, db, dx. When the integrand is smooth and continuous, then the order of integration can be switched. Integrating d phi over 2 pi gives just 2 pi, so the electric field E sub x equals 2 pi rho k times integration over x and the integration over b. After paging down, the previous integral is again here at the top. The b integration, evaluated from 0 to r, has this result. After switching negative terms, we're only left with the x integrand. With its antiderivative, we get this result for the electric field's x component. Next, we'll calculate the scalar voltage at a distance x equals a away from the disk of charge density sigma equals constant c b to the fourth phi cubed cosine phi. Phi lies in the plane of the disk. The total voltage at this point, due to all the little dqs, is obtained by adding together all the little dvs. But dv is k over r dq. But dq is sigma times the differential area dA, which is b db d phi. So our integrand looks like this. The integration over the phi part gives 12 pi squared. So now our voltage looks like this. We use this antiderivative to get this final result for the voltage. 